History is against us when it comes to the US and China forging a common future together. This guy up here, he's not Chinese and he's not American, he's Greek, his name's Thucydides. He wrote the history of the Peloponnesian Wars. And he made this extraordinary observation about Athens and Sparta. It was the rise of Athens and the fear that this inspired in Sparta that made war inevitable. And hence, a whole literature about something called the Thucydides Trap. This guy here, he's not American and he's not Greek, he's Chinese. His name is Sunzi. He wrote The Art of War. And if you see his statement underneath, it's along these lines, attack him where he's unprepared, appear where you are not expected. Not looking good so far for China and the United States. This guy is an American. His name's Graham Allison. In fact, he's a teacher at the Kennedy School over there in Boston. He's working on a single project at the moment, which is, does the Thucydides trap about the inevitability of war between rising powers and established great powers apply to the future of China-US relations? It's a core question. And what Graham has done is explore 15 cases in history since uh, the 1500s to establish what the precedents are. And 11 out of 15 of them, let's, let me tell you, they've ended in catastrophic war. to the forum tonight. I'm Graham Allison, the director of the Belfer Center, and I'm not uh, Greek and I'm not Chinese. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, basically a redneck American from North Carolina, but very pleased to be here. Uh, we have a spectacular evening for you where we're celebrating the uh, production of Kevin Rudd's report, U.S.-China 21, The Future of U.S.-China Relations under Xi Jinping where Kevin, as the subtitle says, tries to build a framework for con of constructive realism for a common purpose. In a word, uh, the purpose of this project, which Kevin pursued last year uh, as a fellow at the Belfer Center, uh, is to give content to the phrase that Xi Jinping uh, first articulated and that Xi Jinping and President Obama embraced at Sunnydale uh, called a, quote, new form of great power relations. So essentially the question is, what means new form of great power relations? And obviously it means not repeating the same mistakes that have been repeated so often that in previous forms of rise versus rule, ended up in conflict, as Kevin suggested, or so-called Thucydides trap. But the notion that a former prime minister who was in his first incarnation a foreign service officer in Australia uh, and a Mandarin speaker from high school uh, and who's had a deep scholarly interest would, after a great political career, spend a year here with us at Harvard at the Kennedy School at the Belfer Center was a fantastic opportunity for, for all of us. So we were thrilled to have the former prime minister here last year. He's now moved to New York, but remains a senior fellow non-resident, and so he comes back here regularly. And uh, this report is the first stage. This is the sort of executive summary of the report, which will be a longer report, but the content of it is what we're discussing tonight. Kevin's going to take about five or six minutes just to give us some highlights from the report. And then we have two excellent panelists who are going to comment on this from their own perspectives. Megan O'Sullivan uh, is a professor of practice here who leads the Geopolitics of Energy uh, initiative. And Megan has been, therefore, very interested in how changes in supply and demand of energy are impacting globally, but including China and the China-American relationship. And then finally, our cleanup hitter is Professor Tony Sage. Tony is, I would say, Mr. China for Harvard. Tony has spent more time and spent more energy investing in building relations and training programs between the US and China than anyone, and has a spectacular set of programs. All three of us are part of a China working group in which these issues have been discussed and debated, but you'll get a chance to hear from the perspective of somebody who's a great China scholar, 
as well as somebody who's thinking about the energy pieces, uh, about whether the initial effort to give more content, more positive content to a new form of great power relations is uh, good enough. So, Kevin, thank you very much for coming home. Thank you very much, Graham, and thank you, uh, colleagues, one and all, for being here, and students of the Harvard Kennedy School and from the bro broader Harvard community. Uh, firstly, to uh, thank uh, the Belfast Centre and Graham for the opportunity to be among you last year uh, and to engage in a rehabilitation program post her career in Australian political life. So thank you for that. I remain in continuing exile here in the United States. The question that I've tried to wrestle with in this report is when you look at the continued rise of China and the continued power of the United States in the world of the 21st century, not just how is this going to turn out, because we can simply assume that there's all, all written in the stars, uh, but what can we do about it? And what can we do about it in terms of shaping a future based on sufficient commonality of values, sufficient commonality of interest to craft a peaceful and prosperous future between these two giant gorillas in the living room of the international relations environment of the 21st century. That's China and the United States. I've tried to do that um, by dividing my report into a couple of parts. The first part seeks to be analytical and that is to look to the extent that I can at some very basic questions uh, concerning China's uh, capacity and constraints for the decade ahead under Xi Jinping's leadership. For those of you who haven't seen the report, it's just coming out online now, it asks these six or seven questions. Number one, given that economic strength is the foundation of national power, is China's economic rise sustainable over the decade ahead or is it likely to falter? My conclusion in the midst of some controversy on these questions recently is that on balance it will continue to grow, albeit at a lesser rate. Any assumption of collapsism concerning uh, China's future I think uh, is unsophisticated in its analysis and the part of some it is a triumph of hope over fact. <coughs> I'd simply leave that for the discussion. The second point and question that I raise is as follows. If this is sustainable, that is, uh, the continued expansion of Chinese power and influence, uh, will China deploy its new found influence under the leadership of Xi Jinping in a different way to which it was done in the past under previous Chinese leaders? My answer to that question is, yes, it will. It will be different and significantly so. And that's anchored in two key variables. One is China now has more regional and global power than his predecessors did. Uh, either three years ago or 13 years ago or certainly 23 years ago. Uh, but beyond that there is something quite diff different in the character and the personality of this Chinese leader. He is, as I've said, uh, around this university for much of last year, certainly uh, the most powerful Chinese leader since Deng Xiaoping and arguably, and I know Rod McFarquhar has this view, uh, the most powerful Chinese leader since Mao. The difference is a key analytical one. When Deng was leader, there were many other revolutionary leaders from the period of China's revolutionary formation in 49 <coughs> and the decades preceding, who basically were co-equals uh, with Deng in the Communist Party hierarchy, Chen Yun and people like that. In the case of uh, Xi Jinping, we do not see um, that um, presence of comparable, uh, comparable individuals of comparable standing in the Standing Committee of the Politburo with him. <coughs> so he is more powerful just as China is more powerful. And there is something about the man's vision in terms of the extension of uh, <coughs> China's um, success story at home and its influence abroad which represents significant lines of departure from the past. It is certainly more confident, others would describe it as more assertive, and it's certainly not a continuation of the ancient maxim of Deng Xiaoping, which is hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead. Uh, that uh, Chinese expression governed China's external engagement with the world for some decades. It has disappeared from the public language of Xi Jinping and the Chinese government in the last couple of years. Third question I ask is, under Xi Jinping, uh, what are China's underlying strategic perceptions of future US political, economic and military power? 
including Beijing's conclusions about Washington's grand strategy towards China. I've sought to reflect on this based on not just what's in the public literature and the public declaratory statements of uh, US policy, but having, uh, with the support of the Belfast Center, been in and out of China at least a dozen times last year, speaking to think tanks, academics, policy advisors, policy makers, Chinese leaders of one description or another, uh, whose, an whose anonymity is buried throughout this report. <laughs> um, but I've so sought to do that in order to add um, flesh and blood <coughs> to the otherwise somewhat impenetrable statements of Chinese declaratory policy. So what's the bottom line on this observation? The baseline Chinese view, when you strip it all away in terms of what they perceive to be uh, China's uh, grand, uh, uh, the Americans' grand strategy towards China, is that they have concluded by and large that the United States, uh, whatever the United States may say or do, ultimately uh, will never readily yield its position as either number one in the region or number one in the world. And this core strategic judgment on the part of our Chinese friends shapes so much of their attitude to what they perceive to be and have deduced to be the content of US operational strategy in Asia and the world. Fourth question I've asked is, uh, what is the em em emerging American perception of Chinese strategy under Xi Jinping, including Washington's responses to Beijing's conclusions about US strategy? And again, I was trying to summarize uh, that based on similar multiple conversations in this country, but also reading the public literature as well. Uh, it is that um, the US by and large concludes uh, internally uh, that, the, that the Chinese grand strategy has a pretty elemental uh, conclusion, which is uh, over time uh, to see the United States as a significant security partner out of Asia, certainly out of East Asia. And that in turn shapes so much of American strategic thinking uh, towards uh, China. The second last question I ask in this report in my remaining 60 seconds is, what's the level of risk of China and the United States for its allies ending up in armed conflict either by accident or design in the decade ahead? And my conclusion is very, very low, if not negligible or non-existent. And there's a good reason for that. It's certainly not in the interests of the People's Republic of China, and the Chinese leadership. The Chinese see very much uh, the relativities of power uh, with the United States in very clear, realist terms. They know that China's economic power, as we've seen recently in debates such as on the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, is slowly shifting in the direction of Beijing, at least in the wider Asian hemisphere, but prospectively from their perspective, possibly across the world, trade flows, investment flows, capital flows. Uh, and let's reflect on that day when uh, the Chinese also liberalized the current account <coughs> and the Chinese yuan uh, becomes a tradable currency fully on global currency markets and begins to assume a status as one of the world's reserve currencies, which may not be far away. But the Chinese equally conclude in realist terms that there is an ocean of difference um, between their current aggregate military capabilities and those of the United States. For those reasons, it is not in China's interest to risk the possibility of any uh, form of military conflict with the United States in the decade ahead. And furthermore, after things got really rough and really sharp, most particularly with Japan, uh, in the events of 2013, 2014, there was a deep realization in Beijing, I think matched by one also in Tokyo, and certainly in Washington, uh, that this set of issues had to be managed down rather than up. Because the possibility, as the author of Essence of Decision concerning the Cuban Missile Crisis would readily tell us, of incident management uh, creating a crisis which in turn requires crisis management, uh, given rampant nationalisms between Japan and uh, China, was such of such an order of magnitude in 2013-14 that frankly the possibility of uh, an event occurring which triggered a wider uh, regional clash was sufficiently real for people to conclude they had to dial it down. And the underlying logic of that again is that if there was to be a regional security crisis of any order of magnitude, it would fundamentally undermine the number one Chinese policy objective 
uh, which is to continue to grow and develop the Chinese economy, uh, which is in the midst of one of the great economic transformations, probably the second great transformation that we've seen since 1979 and Deng's opening of um, <coughs> the Chinese economy to a market reform process at home and global economic engagement. And the final question I ask is, how is China's expanding political, foreign policy, economic influence like to shape the future of the regional and global order, and will this be acceptable or inimical to US interests? The bottom line is, uh, if we simply stand back in the absence of any shared strategic narrative between China and the United States, there is a grave danger that, in fact, uh, incrementally, the two countries, their respective policy establishments, both the security policy establishment and their instruments of economic power, cause the two countries not just to drift further apart, but to increase the prospects of one level of longer term crisis or conflict uh, or the other. The way to minimise that um, is, as I argue, uh, twofold. One is to uh, recommend that for the first time in the history of this complex relationship, China and the United States, that the two of them actually develop a common strategic narrative for their future. At present, privately, each has a narrative about the other. I've described what those were just before. If you were to ask Beijing and China, what is your common narrative for the future other than just preventing war, it's very difficult to actually get a collective articulation of what that might be. There is, for example, no Chinese-American equivalent of what uh, President Obama and Prime Minister Modi released most recently during the President's visit to India uh, on a common vision for the Asia-Pacific region and Asia more broadly. Therefore, I argue, number one, there's a need for a common narrative, a common strategic narrative, because that actually informs elements of, this, of the policy behaviour, significant elements of the policy behaviour of both the Chinese and, to some extent, the American policy establishments as well. The second thing I recommend is, well, what do you call this thing, uh, which is in any way coherent, uh, both in English and Chinese, is to make sense to both sets of policy and political establishments. And having spent a long time last year testing various words and concepts with our Chinese friends, uh, and occasionally with our friends here in Washington as well, who are less bound up with the notion of what you call things, um, as uh, our Chinese friends tend to be, I've hit upon the concept of what I describe as uh, constructive realism for a common purpose. Your uh, And uh, the reason I have done that is because, number one, when you're looking at uh, this uh, relationship, they are deeply realist, deeply realist, both strategic and foreign policy traditions. And therefore, it's important in constructing this relationship that there is a realist recognition up front of the six to seven areas in this relationship, including arms sales to Taiwan, which frankly, there is no foreseeable solution to in the period ahead. They need to be recognised, acknowledged, and with a common agreement to manage them to the point that they don't single-handedly destroy the entire relationship. Point two, constructive in what I would see is a much longer list of about 20 recommendations, which I put forward in the report, bilaterally, regionally and globally, where the US and China have sufficient commonality of values, have sufficient commonality of interest to build bilateral, regional and global public goods together. And in particular, I make recommendations about their common work, respectively, in building a robust regional institution uh, in the Asia-Pacific region, which includes the other principal players, both in the economy and security there. And finally, I recommend that we need a machinery uh, to do that, which comes out of the just nascent emerging um, structure of working level summitry between China and the United States, which until Sunnylands happened in 2013, uh, frankly, um, was not a characteristic of the relationship before. The idea of a regular annual working summit between the two with a list of constructive proposals, a list of realist differences, but with one objective also in mind. If you do enough on the constructive side, it helps construct uh, over time sufficient political capital, diplomatic capital, and frankly, step by step strategic trust to in turn deal with some of the intractables in the realist category of differences between the two. Uh, that have so long uh, hung around the relationship's head. Will this approach, if taken seriously by policymakers, actually work? Uh, 
I'm not sure. Uh, what I am sure, though, is that and there, there are two strategic options. One is basically inertia and drift, and the other is actually constructing a common narrative with these elements around it. There is a higher probability that we might be able to avoid Thucydides' trap. Thank you very much. Good, good. So, so this report, uh, if you go to the Belfer Center website, just belfercenter.org, you can read the report tonight. Uh, and uh, I had a chance to read through it uh, yesterday uh, in the version that's gone up. And I would say it's a great read. So, and it's uh, very well written, and it's not very long. So, uh, <laughs> Megan, uh, tell us about whatever you think about the, the whole idea, but including in particular the energy dimensions. And I would uh, like to add my thanks and appreciation for having Prime Minister Rudd with us for last year. It was such a privilege to actually um, benefit from his insights, his analysis. What neither Graham nor the Prime Minister has said is that it takes a very unique person to write this kind of report. You know, the fact that he has really intimate knowledge of both the Chinese and the American side, not just the policy making, not just the interests, but really the cultures, which are so important to understanding this bilateral relationship, I think is, is really critical. There's so much uh, to commend in this report, and I think I'm getting a signal that I'm not. I think they had the order me then then to you. I oh, think that was okay. the problem. Excellent. Is that, that's better? I can Great. even tell. Um, for those of you who couldn't hear me, I was simply uh, praising this, this effort, this report, and talking about how it is unique in the sense that it is written by a person who has intimate knowledge of both the American and the Chinese side, not only in terms of policy making um, and interests, but also in terms of culture, which is so important for making the kinds of recommendations that are um, held in this report. And I really, I commend it to you. It is a good read. Um, it's interesting, it's creative and innovative. And there's a lot to commend in the report. I'm going to limit myself. Um, I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm sitting between two great cyanologists and that uh, my areas of expertise lie elsewhere. So I'm going to give you some thoughts um, and comments on the report, really from the perspective of a former policymaker and as an American, and just as giving you some reactions that uh, an American policymaker might have to some of the suggestions. And this isn't limited to the Republican realm or the Democratic realm. I think uh, I think you'll find people in, in both parties who would who would have some of the same uh, areas of appreciation or concern. So mm. I'll just quickly say uh, three three things that I particularly appreciated about the report, and then two areas that I think um, are areas that are still ones of concern for me, and I'll, I'll put forward a little modification of a few ideas. In terms of the areas of appreciation, Prime Minister Rudd went through the seven questions that he addresses in the report. And again, from the perspective of a former policymaker, you know, he is offering what I would consider key judgments about the United States and about China and about their relationship. And as a policymaker, we always talk about that the ideal policy is one that's resilient enough for any scenario to materialize. And of course that's true, but the reality is that often you have to make a judgment about you know, what you're going to base your strategy or your policy on going forward. And these seven questions I really look at as those key judgments. And the one that, you know, the report begins with is perhaps the simplest, but is really critical is this point about China's economic growth. You're all probably aware there's a very interesting and robust debate about whether China has really peaked and we're going to see that its economic miracle is, has really run the course or whether this is sustainable. This is a key judgment for any policymaker, and the Prime Minister states very clearly that it would be foolish to base your policy on an assumption that China's economic growth is not going to continue. Maybe not exactly at the level it is, but going forward, we need to have a strategy of policy assuming that we're going to see continued economic growth. Um, so again, those key judgments are really an important part of the report. Second, in terms of things I appreciate, I really um, think the, the report underscores the sense of opportunity that both countries have now.
And even, I would say, the report talks with a sense of urgency that actually there are new things afoot in China and that these new developments could create an opportune moment to refashion this bilateral conversation. And a lot of the report, I think, attributes this to the leadership of President Xi, and that seems like a very wise and sensible attribution. And I would just add that there are other factors that make this perhaps an important and unique moment, and that's where I'd bring in the energy. Um, perhaps, again, not being a cyanologist, but somebody who watches China quite closely, up until recently, I've always, when I've been thinking about or anticipating Chinese foreign policy, I've always thought that their pursuit of energy was maybe the greatest single determinant of their external behavior. That if all things were equal, the Chinese would rather not be you know, involved in Africa and Latin America and elsewhere, but their pursuit of energy requires them to go outside, and that that was how you could best understand their foreign policy. But the energy landscape internationally has changed dramatically in the years since President Xi has come to power. And now the Chinese and the rest of us are looking at the world not through a lens of energy scarcity, but one of energy abundance. And that, I think, changes core strategic considerations. And it also very clearly puts, um, you know, takes the focus off of possible competition over energy resources and allows Chinese policymakers to look at some of the policies that they pursued in the past decade, such as the going out policy in Africa, and think, is that really serving Chinese interests? And if not, you know, are there other approaches that could be taken? Thirdly, on my list of uh, things of appreciation, I would really commend uh, the section, the conclusion, in which Prime Minister Rudd lays out very, very specific recommendations um, in the context of what I think is a very constructive recommendation of the need to build this common strategic narrative that he spoke about. So there's a very specific list. It's almost uh, an action agenda for Chinese and American policymakers. Now let me just talk about two areas which I think uh, many, at least American policymakers, would still sort of have their antennas up or would have questions for the Prime Minister, and I hope he'll take the opportunity to um, comment on them. And the first has to do with the international order. I think one of the really big ideas in this report is not that the U.S. is a status quo power trying to defend this international liberal order, and that China is a revisionist power trying to destroy that order and build something different. I think the report puts forward this, this, what I find to be a relatively new idea, that actually, rather than being status quo and revisionist, we have two powers which have a common interest in building an international order that works. You know, and the idea put forward is, hey, the international order isn't perfect now, the United States should recognize that, and the United States should be for the idea of reform, and China is for the idea of reform and not necessarily for the destruction of the current order, and that the two could actually have a common purpose in working together to chart out something that would be sustainable and in line with both of their interests. Now, where I have my skepticism, my skeptical hat on, is I, I come to this uh, question about to what extent is China really interested in being a steward of a global order? To what extent is China really interested in assuming, either in the short term or even in the long term, um, the sort of role that the United States has in constructing and perpetuating an international order, which is being a global problem solver, being a provider of uh, public goods. There's a report out this week as well, a very different report on China, by Bob Blackwell and Ashley Tellis of the Council on Foreign Relations, and they take a very different view. And I, you know, again, maybe this is an American perspective, but I, I do find myself, um, if not agreeing with their prescriptions, a little sympathetic to their analysis, which says that China's view towards a global international order is very instrumental. It's interested in an international order to the extent that it advances China's status or it advances China's direct interest, but not interested in a global order of the kind that the United States is interested in constructing and maintaining. So I think the question is, is there sufficient basis for these two countries to, to really reform, construct, build a, a global order together? And here, just a, a, a suggestion or maybe a query, is perhaps there's enough in the economic realm. 
Maybe there's enough common interest there, enough places where China's interest can be coincide, it can coincide with a, uh, a global interest. But on the political and security side, um, my feeling is perhaps we're still a long way off from having really a, a common joint vision. And uh, just quickly on my last point um, is about regional cooperation. As Prime Minister Rudd mentioned, the report lays out some very detailed and very interesting recommendations about building regional cooperation, um, rejuvenating certain uh, regional institutions and having that cooperation be the basis upon which China and the United States can build confidence in their relationship, can build strategic trust. This is obviously an imperative. But when I think again in my, again maybe I'm one of those American policymakers who you are trying to reach uh, in the sense of, I, I think about why isn't there more institutionalization in Asia? And part of me thinks that the response is because China actually isn't that interested in talking about any, certainly any hard security issues in a multilateral context. That you know, not only is China not interested in talking about those issues in a multilateral context, certainly isn't interested in negotiating those. Think about Russia and how Russia's interest is really in dealing with European countries individually rather than as a collective. In my mind, China sees that as the dominant power um, the, you know, in, in Asia, apart from the United States, in terms of dealing with its neighbors, that maybe it's going to be better off and able, better to able to advance Chinese interests through bilateral negotiation. So to what extent is China really going to want to resolve and talk about issues in a multilateral context? And there, and I'll end with my, my uh, perhaps suggestion or thought, is perhaps it's better for the U.S. and China to build this strategic trust outside of the Asia Pacific region where things are so difficult and contentious. Maybe there are other parts of the world that are more fertile ground for building that cooperation. And there, you know, I put on my Middle Eastern hat and I see there's a part of the world where China has extraordinary economic interests, extraordinary energy interests, but it hasn't actually figured out or maybe has yet wanted to translate that economic interest into political interests. Um, but there's a lot of common interest between the United States and China in regional stability in the Middle East. And perhaps could that venue be a better one, maybe a less contentious one, for building some of the strategic trust that uh, Prime Minister Rudd's report so rightly points out is essential to moving forward and, and, and uh, reaching a better future than the one we might be on track for right now. So good. Thank you very much. Tony, what do you say? Um. <coughs> I think both sets of uh, comments, of course, are excellent. And um, I, what I do like uh, with Kevin's report is that it is an interesting counter to what has come out with the Black Wolf report, rather than saying that, you know, America facilitated much of China's rise. Now we need to be very careful about the consequences of that and maybe build things around it. Uh, as having grown up in Europe, I've always actually thought the U.S. is extremely instrumental in its use of global institutions, uh, to be quite honest. Oh, but, uh, Tony, I'm shocked. <laughs> shocked. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, coming to related things to the report, I have uh, five comments I'd like to make. First, clearly there will be the emergence of China as the largest economy, although India is not going to be very far behind. And then I think there's a psychological question for Americans. Not only will you not be number one, you won't be number two, but you'll be number three. And I'm not sure how people adjust to that. But I think what is much more important than that is that when the US was the undisputed number one, and when many thought that Japan would become number one, it was associated also with the highest living standards in the world. And that is not going to be the case with China. China is going to become the number one economy, but it's still going to be a very poor country. And I think that will, for a very long time, uh, inc have consequences for its power, for its actions that it can undertake, and what people may admire in the country, and how other people will see that country. So I think that's a very significant amendment I would make to the sort of comments of, well, it's going to become the number one economy, this, this, and this will happen. Secondly, relating to something that um, Megan just raised, I'd like to make a couple of comments about the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, 
because I, I don't see that as a challenge uh, by China to a US dominated uh, global financial architecture. I mean, Larry uh, a little while ago wrote, that, you know, perhaps last month will be seen as a watershed, the end of the US dominance uh, in this area. And I think there's a lot of truth to that, but I actually think why China has done this is to get better returns economically and politically on its foreign exchange. If you look at what it's done, it has not been very successful in bilateral relations. You know, the China Investment Corporation has not been successful in producing big returns for China. Its bilateral engagements have not always been very successful. In Zambia, you know, the president won the election by running against China. Uh, in Myanmar, Peru, we've seen similar problems. So I think there's something more subtle at play uh, with um, China's move to a multilateral institution. And clearly, you can bully people, you know, as the US shows, much better through bilateral institutions. But I think China has figured out it hasn't done very well in that framework. And so AIIB offers the security of a multilateral framework that helps it get better economic returns and maybe meet some of its political objectives. Uh, thirdly, what I see in Kevin's report is an, an implicit division between the existing architecture of the World Bank, IMF, and so forth that requires reform uh, to increase influence from other, other nations, but then also new areas of global public goods management or challenges that really require new structures where China might be able to play an equal part. And I'm very struck by Megan's comment that maybe you do that outside of Asia. Maybe that's less contentious ground it might be able to deal with. I would then divide it, though, into three sets of problems in this new architecture to look for collaborations. One is what we might call the challenges of the global commons. And there, global warming, fisheries, water shortages, for example. The second one would be the challenges of global commitment combating infectious diseases, natural disasters, and including peacekeeping within that framework. And then the challenges of global regulation, the financial architecture, IPR, trade and investment regimes. And that might be some way to get towards the practicality that you're talking about of, you know, would China really be serious to come in those when we make it that practical, for example. Then very quickly, my last two comments, and this was um, what can the US do as this transition is taking place? And I was very struck by a comment that Keisha Mababani made last week here in the forum. And I think this is true. And he said, you know, US behavior as number one will be important in influencing how China might behave when it becomes number one. And so he was putting out a word of caution that if the US is seen as using global institutions in its own interest, why on earth shouldn't China take that as a lesson? And it would do exactly the same. So I do think in this phase that we're going through, uh, I think the US can make considerable progress in defining how China might behave uh, as a number one economic power by looking at its own behavior. And my very last point, um, I agree with um, Kevin that the economy may be sustainable, but the real question is how durable the political system may be. Now, I'm not supporting the systemic uh, collapse thesis, and I'm certainly not naive enough to believe that a lim liberal democratic uh, regime is going to emerge in my lifetime. When I was first in China in the Cultural Revolution, a little bit after, I thought maybe I'd live to see it happen, but it, I not, don't think it's going to happen now. Anyway, but I do think that historically, concentrated power and closed systems have tended not to survive. So China will really have to become the first uh, political system to deal with an increasingly diverse society, urbanization, rise of the middle class, redistribution or politics within the framework of an authoritarian regime. And I think the idea of treating your citizens as children, the paternalism, the infantilization which goes along with the Chinese regime is really outdated in the modern world. Um, you know, you can't really treat uh, your citizens as children who need to be told what they can see, what they can't see, what is good news, what is bad news. And there I think this does relate, and I do agree with your comments about Xi Jinping and his power, but really for the way forward over the longer term is concentrating power really viable. And things like the anti-corruption campaign also I think uh, campaign, uh, contain dangers. So I don't know what they are, 
but I think major political adjustments are going to occur. Uh, and I think we need to sketch out different scenarios of where that might lead, some of which are certainly far worse than what we're dealing with at the present time. Thank you, Tony. Uh, excellent. So thank you. <laughs> so let me uh, say what we're, how we're going to use the next uh, about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, uh, there's opportunities to ask questions, and there's microphones both here and at the loges. But uh, as, you're, as you're lining up, go right ahead. We let's let Kevin have a chance to react briefly to the comments we've heard from Megan and, uh, and Tony. That's great. <clears throat> well, firstly, thanks to Megan and Tony for uh, their uh, uh, commentary and their analysis. <coughs> uh, I would summarize in Chinese Megan's as uh, uh, Which is unfair, because I don't exactly. Know exactly. I was going to translate it. Yeah. No, I was going to say the three supports and the two do not supports. The, um, but I think on the, the two points uh, which you raise are entirely valid questions about which I think a lot. At its baseline, uh, your question is is China and it, through its government uh, really interested uh, in? being a constructive reformer of the global order and beyond that a co-participant in the management of the order? Or is it going to be, to use the term which Tony critiqued before, purely instrumentalist? Uh, and secondly, are they serious about um, regional institutions and architecture in East Asia which would have uh, them engage in not just a discourse on but effective regional problem solving of local security problems. And these are very valid <coughs> baseline questions. My overall answer to it as follows is these things are malleable. If we assume that uh, China is simply heading in this unilateralist direction vis-a-vis -vis its uh, engagement uh, on the reform of the global order, uh, in order exclusively to advance its national interests uh, and that is fixed in concrete and that it will permanently eschew uh, regional institutions uh, which would require it to engage in robust discussion of uh, and common solutions of security questions of direct relevance to it. If we reach that hard and fast conclusion then frankly that's how it's going to turn out. And when I say it's malleable, is that both those realist interpretations of Chinese strategic behavior I'm acutely conscious of and have seen multiple examples of um, throughout uh, modern Chinese history. But the bottom line is, uh, given the dynamics of what we call loosely in the trade globalization, this is now malleable. It could turn out exactly as you've just suggested. But why am I engaged in this project? Because I think there is half a chance uh, that if we uh, were to adopt a different conceptual framework on joint collaboration, on order improvement, and then secondly, on regional institution building in Asia, what I call an Asia-Pacific community, which then meshes with the deep-lying Chinese interest about how, in fact, uh, you don't uh, accidentally trigger conflict in the next 10 to 15 years, when it's not in China's strategic sense of opportunity to have that, that some form of regional institution building which um, reduces that risk. Uh, to paraphrase a term for US-China relations, I think we should give uh, peace a bit of a chance. Um, and that is what I'm suggesting uh, at both those levels. I am deeply realist about the problems associated with both of them. Um, but unless we are prepared to give the in liberal internationalist arm a flap, uh, then frankly, I think we're simply allowing realist conclusions to dictate a realist outcome. Uh, second point, which I just take up with um, Tony, and his five points are excellent, but I know we've got a dialogue to have here, but let me just go to his last one, which is the sustainability of the Chinese political economy and more the politics and the economy. Now, this is the great question we do not know the answer to, but my response to it is essentially along the lines of uh, my response on the economy. Having gone through the 1900 critiques of the Chinese economic model and its likelihood of sustaining reasonable levels of economic growth for the decade ahead and concluding on balance as I do that it will be foolhardy uh, 
for Americans to assume that the model is simply going to either in extremis implode or so correct in terms of growth as to fundamentally derail long-term projections about the size of China's global economic influence. I have the same conclusion about the politics. I mean, I did my university dissertation uh, back in the Paleolithic age uh, on, uh, on human rights in China, about the same time as um, you know, Tony was r rolling around in the Cultural Revolution, or probably just, just a little bit after that. And I've got to say, um, uh, we've seen the ebbs and flows of this debate within the Chinese polity over a long period of time. But again, my baseline assumption is that Xi Jinping's model is a state capitalist model. I choose to call it that. Mm. Uh, I think it's the best description I can find of it. And he is convinced, and those around him are convinced, it's sustainable. There are many things which may cause that not to be the case, but I think the robust assumption in terms of policymakers around the world is to assume that in one form or another, that will sustain at least for the period of the decade ahead mm -hmm. that is my framework for analysis and policy recommendation. Thank you. These are great questions that you can actually read about in the paper every day and place your own bets. So uh, either China is going to sustain 7% growth this year and over the next several years, and if it does, that's one world, or it's not, and that's a different world. Either the political system is going to hold together more or less, that's one world, or it's not. That's another world. It's very easy, actually, to write the story of either one of those. One of the things that policymakers have to do is make their bets, and the rest of us. So I think we've heard a good, you know, a good elucidation of that. And one of the things that Kevin's report uh, does forthrightly, and just as Megan had said, doesn't try to say, on the other hand, one hand, on the other hand, it's very complicated, blah, 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 it says, here's my answer. So uh, you can at least see what it is. I, I think there's a, a 30 second uh, coda to that, which is having at a um, lesser level as a prime minister of a middle power confronted these sort of decisions in our own region. The bottom line is you have to make on balance judgments. Mm. What I've sought to do here is put myself in the position of those in governments, either in Washington or in Beijing, and say, what's your on balance judgment about each other? Is my here is my unbalanced judgment about how these things are going to prevail and therefore what should be uh, the policy we should pursue. Um, I don't think, in my experience of dealing with policy advisors, uh, that when someone does front before you in front of a prime ministerial presidential desk and give you the proverbial on the one hand and the other, you know, you're tempted just to reach out and punch them. Mm -hmm. Because you don't have time for all of that. <laughs> You've got to make a call. <laughs> Harry Truman once said famously, give me a one-armed economist. <laughs> uh, so this gentleman. Please introduce yourself. Sure. Short sure. Uh, questions and then in with a question mark. Good evening. My name is Nico. I'm a mid-career here at the Kennedy School. I'm also the co-founder of the Future Society at the Kennedy School, which is a student club. Uh, my question is building upon Professor Ho Sullivan's last point vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East and how China and the U.S. can build trust elsewhere where challenges are less uh, important. Last week we had Kishore Mabubani. I asked the same question, which is what can we expect from the rise of China and how we change the way uh, Middle East is stabilized in a new form of partnership. In his very provo I mean, mildly provocative style, he somehow dodged part of the question, only saying that uh, uh, he believed that Chinese would not follow an adventurist policy in the Middle East. Uh, and I would like to raise the same question tonight, especially knowing that uh, China is close to Iran, China is close to Saudi Arabia, China is not so far from Israel, China is close to uh, Egypt. Actually, Mohammed Morsi's first trip was to China and not to Saudi Arabia, not to the U.S. So uh, to you, Professor Osolivan, and also to Prime Minister Kevin Rood and, uh, and all the panel, what do you see as the future of uh, the potential stabilization of the Middle East through the lens of this new U.S.-China 21st century partnership? Good, good question. Kevin? Just to look at, um, this is one of uh, Megan's earlier uh, very, very sharp and useful observations, which goes down to the extent to which Chinese energy policy informs the rest of its foreign policy. And to put it at its bluntest, um, that that is its principal uh, global interest, not just in terms of energy, but raw materials, in the case of iron ore from my own fair country. Um, 
And in addition to that, uh, China would rather the rest of the complexity of the world simply just went away um, because it's all too hard. <laughs> I think uh, the truth of it all is, and I've had a lot of experience of dealing with um, Chinese policy advisors uh, on their attitudes towards the Middle East. Your observation is absolutely right, sir, that China at this stage wishes to be the friend of all and the enemy of none uh, in the wider Middle East. And if you look at Chinese dynamics in terms of, um, in terms of uh, energy security long term, it makes sense. However, uh, China also is now confronted with a, a most basic reality. Look at the most recent implosion, the geopolitics in Yemen. And suddenly you've got X hundred once again, uh, Chinese nationals to get out. You had 13 to 15,000 to get out from Libya. And suddenly China faces itself because of its massive, um, uh, not the diaspora, but frankly workforce of Chinese nationals abroad, relying upon international systems to in effect uh, deal with the crises that they are facing. So what I am sensing is the very beginnings of an evolution. And that is driven by one dynamic. And that is, China's global interests are now so pervasive, uh, driven through the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the instrument of their economy, uh, where they are now the world's largest trading nation. And prospectively, uh, they are now the world's third largest uh, source of uh, foreign direct investment. And they will become a significant force in global capital flows. But you're going to see this, mul and you've got the Chinese workforce around the world. And if you've got 1% of 1.3 million people out there, that's a lot of Chinese folks working around the world. So whether China likes it or not, it is now confronted yep. with all of this. But my concluding point partly comes back to Megan's correct observation, which is <coughs> China will take a long time, a very long time, and I think it's at the beginnings of this process, hence my earlier comments about malleability and the desirability of working with our, with our Chinese friends now on reforming elements of the global order together, of frankly working out how they work within this order themselves, not just in the pursuit of their own interests, but as they're already doing with peacekeeping, uh, contributing to global public goods as well. Uh, I don't see them taking sides in any Middle Eastern conflict anytime soon. So we're, our time is short, but if you have a short statement, Megan, if you, wanna, if you have a comment, make a short. Sure. Please. Um, okay. I, I would agree very much with what Kevin just said about we're seeing the beginnings of an evolution. I think, again, this factors not only into the Chinese-U.S. dynamics, but into the new energy realities. So by 2030, you'll have 90% of Middle Eastern oil going to Asia, and you'll have virtually none of it going to the United States. So this changes some pretty basic dynamics, and it certainly changes, changes the politics and the perceptions. Um, and so I think you're already seeing a little disquiet, not just in the Middle East, but even in China, about, well, who is actually going to be stabilizing the Middle East if the United States doesn't have the same level of interest in doing so? We could argue about why the U.S. should still have the same level of interest, but the point is the perception exists and will only be intensified that the U.S. has diminishing interests in stabilizing the Middle East while China has rising interest in that. And somewhere along the lines, you know, greater burden sharing is going to make sense. But I think the, the um, and this will be my last phrase, Graham, I think the, the, the obstacles of that are not just on the Chinese side, I think on the American side, we haven't done a lot of work um, in terms of thinking about where we want to welcome Chinese activity, behavior, collaboration in the Middle East. There's not a lot that we feel like we'd like to give up to China. Maybe very specific scripted roles, but probably not the ones that they're interested in taking. So I think it's an area that um, will be uh, a growth one for the future, and a lot of thinking needs to be done on it. I'll give you just a footnote. I was in China for just a day, about three weeks ago. I was having dinner with uh, two people whom I know extremely well, one of whom is a graduate of the Kennedy School, and one of whom is in the first circle for uh, you know, with the advisory. You know, the subject of the Middle East came up. And the one was saying to me, we're talking about strategy and what are you doing? One was saying, you know, we hope that you really take uh, ISIL as a more serious threat and get more directly involved. And this notion of no troops on the ground, you know, I think you're going to have to give that up. And, you know, you should become more engaged in this. And the other one, who we know even better, so we were chuckling, and he said, yes, we would love for you to get deeper and deeper into this star baby <laughs> because we're not interested in you looking at us, okay? Please. <laughs> 
Hello, my name is uh, Connor Riley, and I'm a sophomore at the college. And, and my question is more directly for Professor O'Sullivan. And it's, it's building on your thought that what happens when China takes uh, more of a political interest in the Middle East, only I, I want to apply that sort of thinking to an area that's more familiar to America's sphere of influence, uh, South America. Last summer, uh, President Xi Jinping just took his first visit and tour of South America. Uh, it's my understanding that Chinese investors uh, have just begun plans to build a new canal uh, through the original Nicaragua route. That that was you know there was too there was too much jungle at the time, uh, but also you know uh, incredible direct investments in South America, two transcontinental railroads potentially being built in the north. Um, and I, I guess my question is, what happens when, you know, as of now, there's great Chinese economic investment in South America, when that interest becomes political, uh, what do you see for the future of American and Chinese economic cooperation when perhaps modern interpretations of the good neighbor policy would, would almost, you know, maybe have a kick, uh, a knee-jerk reaction to good. increased Chinese, yeah. Thank you. Sure, I, and I'm sure that Kevin or Tony may want to comment on this as well. I think Latin America is a very, it's a very interesting place to think about where China has built a lot of economic influence. Um, and I think at the forefront of that, um, I have in my mind the oil for loans arrangements, particularly with Venezuela. So it seems to me, looking at it from a little more distance than maybe our other panelists, that China has consciously built up this economic leverage, but it's not entirely clear what that leverage is going to be used for. It's not clear that China has uh, a political objective to be reached, that it's almost husbanding this, this leverage to be used at some point in the future to be determined. Um, and I think that uncertainty, if I'm correct about that, I think that actually creates an opportunity for the United States and China. Um, take the current situation in Venezuela. The, it's very possible that this is a country which is going to have a much, much more difficult, very near-term future that neither the United States nor China is going to be interested in seeing unfold or certainly will have joint interests in mitigating it. And there, actually, China may end up uh, being in a position to use its economic leverage to a political purpose that it could coordinate with the United States. So I think it's another area um, where we could um, work with China to, uh, as, as Kevin was saying, this malleable moment to actually uh, try to come to better joint political outcomes. That may be a, quite an optimistic interpretation, but I think it's not totally, uh, totally unreasonable. And Tony, that connects to what you said about the kind of assessment in China now of we seem to have made fairly lousy investments in many of these settings. You want to say another word about that? Well, I think I'd just very quickly, three things. I mean, first, the Chinese mantra that we don't appear in the internal affairs of other countries is gone. Yeah. I mean, whether it likes it or not, it is. And it's been very bad at doing that to date. And I think um, what I would say, you know, related to this is that um, the investments have been pretty much ad hoc. I don't think they've been part of a strategy, with the exception, obviously, of natural resources and uh, oil. And it hasn't sort of been backed up by a political or military related strategy to that. And I think, but what I think we're now beginning to see is uh, two things beginning to happen. The first is, if you talk to Chinese policymakers, one of their biggest fears is that uh, the US might absolve itself of its responsibility for providing global order. And then they don't know what to do under that situation. And that makes for uncertainty. Uh, the second thing, though, is I think that what is beginning to happen, and this is more clear in Central Asia and uh, Southeast Asia, the glimmerings of a more coherent Chinese strategy is beginning to emerge. And I, you know, they're not very experienced in global diplomacy. And historically, they've been appalling at it. I mean, if you go back, whether it was in the 1950s or whether it was promoting revolution in Southeast Asia, you know, it's, it's not, been and not been very successful, and neither of their bilateral investments on the whole really built them huge political capital. Good. This gentleman, please. Yes, uh, hello. My name is Mabo Moisla. I'm a student at the business school. And my question is about the notion that China may perhaps grow old before it grows rich. And I was curious as to what your view is on the impact of 
the demographics on ch China's continued um, economic expansion and in turn what um, impact that may have on its relationship with the United States. Great question. Kevin. It's an excellent question and um, Tony will have much to contribute on this. Uh, when the full report underpinning this, which is several hundred pages in, pages in length, emerges either online or in book form, and I haven't decided which yet, um, this I deal with at some length because it is a fundamental question concerning, let's call it Chinese capabilities and constraints for the decade plus beyond. And this is one which the current Chinese administration is wrestling with. So the basic metrics I think people are familiar with. The uh, labor force began to shrink a year and a half ago. Uh, the population by Chinese projections is to peak in about 2025, 2026. And so therefore, these have profound implications as you can anticipate both in terms of the future of Chinese fiscal policy, uh, the usual um, problem with aging populations, and uh, what's required to be funded out of budget for that, social security, health and the rest, and aged care. Uh, and therefore that's less to spend on things like national security, defense and the rest. So this is already a dynamic uh, in the Chinese public policy deliberation process. You see partial response from that in the last 12 months under Xi Jinping uh, in terms of the beginnings, the beginnings of liberalization of the one child policy. Uh, but frankly, that's a generational investment and that assumes that's gonna radically change Chinese behavior. Uh, because um, there, is, um, there is some resistance to that occurring as well. But here is the macro point that I wish to make about this whole question of the aggregation of power. And it's been touched on by comments from our colleague uh, here at Belfer, uh, Bob Zellick and others, and the work they've done on NAFTA, which is if we assume, as I do in the report, and on balanced judgment, that for the decade ahead you're going to see Chinese growth rates somewhere north of 6%, um, which the Chinese internally define as being that which is necessary for sustaining social stability. Um, it would be wrong to assume that this simply places China in a long-term trajectory uh, for, shall I say, permanent um, global um, economic uh, dominance. We've already made reference to the rise of India. But if you look at the NAFTA economies and aggregate them, as we've discussed internally at Belfer over a long period of time, by the time you get to mid-century, and you've got uh, 400 million people living in this country, population still, it's still growing. You've got um, um, a couple of hundred million people, 150 million people in Mexico. And the Canadians, um, if they get their act together, a few more as well. Sorry, a friend of Canada. <laughs> but uh, you're looking at 600 million people living, living in this NAFTA economy of called North America. If the Chinese population the same period of time contracts down on some of the more pessimistic scenarios from a Chinese point of view or optimistic. Uh, from another perspective, down to 1.1 or even 1 billion, and you still have a per capita income gap, you are not therefore looking at this permanent sort of um, parting of the ways in terms of China's aggregate global economic power against all other comers, be it India at one level, or frankly these NAFTA economies in a different direction. So from a national power point of view, uh, quite apart from the internal fiscal constraints that I alluded to earlier, your question is a very significant one for the future out to 2050 when most of the people in this world will be making all the major public, po in this room will be making all the public policy uh, decisions that, Absolutely. We, that we need. And some of us will be cheering them on. So unfortunately we've come close to the witching hour, but we have two people right here, and the lady first and then the man. Let me ask you to ask your questions together and then we'll let the panelists wrap up, please. Sure, my name is Yen, I'm a second year MBA in Harvard Business School. So the question actually um, came from a line from Megan. Um, there's the observation that the Chinese government has changed their lens on energy from energy scarcity to energy abundance. I just found that line really intriguing, especially you quoted the recent shifts in China's investment in Africa. I'm wondering what are some evidence that you've seen such that uh, you've came to this con conclusion, observation. Thank you. Good, thank you. And let me take the gentleman's question too. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kumar Anuradha and I'm a, a mid-career um, student. And I have a question regarding um, China becoming number one. I'm wondering, is, do you see any possibility that even if China becomes number one, the global order will not be shaped by the fact that it is number one or who is number two or number three, but it's more a collective of nations which will shape the global policy because then you will see not a huge difference between who is number one, number two, number three. So I'm just wondering that 
should we be thinking about a time that actually we are looking at the global order which will not be shaped by number one or number two, but a collective of nations? Thank you. Okay, we have just a few minutes of short comments. To, and maybe why don't we start with uh, Tony okay. and then Megan and give Kevin the last word. Okay? Yeah, I think, um, I think China's capacity when it's the number one economy in size is going to be considerably less than the capacity that the United States of America had in the phase that it's been number one. That would lead me to the conclusion that you might get more collaborative outcomes uh, than we've seen previously uh, and that you'd have different coalitions uh, forming. So in that sense, I'm reasonably optimistic. And you also have to take into account that China has been uh, really the primary beneficiary of the existing global trade, financial, economic order. It's uh, you know, been hugely beneficial once it decided to junk, uh, dunk uh, its uh, policies uh, you know, before 1978 and essentially moved to close approximation with what has been successful elsewhere in East Asia. Um, the state capitalism, I agree with uh, Kevin uh, completely. Uh, coming from Europe, you know, we're not so frightened by state engagement in the economy as sometimes people in America are. And so, you know, there may be nothing intrinsically wrong with that model. Um, uh, there may be problems the way it's governed, so on and so forth. So yes, I think on that question, um, I think we may have to see more sharing. And it's also, as our colleague Joe Nye has talked about, you have to look at different categories. And he talks about this three-dimensional chess game. In military terms, you know, America can do a lot of what it wants, but you know, it's quite clear across a whole range of issues, it knows that it can't act unilaterally. And I think China understands that full well also. So I think this feeds into Kevin's uh, you know, suggestions about this constructive realism. I mean, national interest is always going to dominate for both the US and for China, but how do you find areas of partnership uh, within that, I think, become crucial. So I'm reasonably optimistic about that. The question on demographics, let's just let me say very briefly, that is the unknown. I mean, we just don't know what it means for a country to grow old before it grows rich. Most of the other countries have had uh, a certain abundance in their fiscal capabilities to deal with becoming old. And China, and then followed by India, is going to move into uncharted terrain. It's likely to be extremely disruptive. It's likely to be very costly. The Chinese are now talking about raising uh, the pension age. As you know, people in China retire at 55 and 50 um, because that was based on life expectancy in the 1950s. There's considerable resistance to changing that. They're talking about having a plan in 2017, but we will not even move to implement it until 2022. So they know how contentious that is. So, but you also have to be careful about dependency ratios between the east uh, and the western parts of China. In a city like Shanghai, it's elderly dependency ratios. In areas like Guizhou, it's child dependency ratios. So you know, one policy is not going to be able to deal with this effectively. Well, Megan, briefly, please. Sure. Yeah. Um, just on, on the energy point, um, this, this is my hypothesis that uh, the Chinese leadership has started to look at the energy picture differently and that that has um, opened up new possibilities in the realm of international uh, behavior. And I would say, I won't spend a lot of time, but there are simply a whole set of facts about the movement from scarcity to abundance. That if you look 10 years ago, a lot of the literature on US-Chinese relations um, started with this idea of competition over energy resources. That has completely vanished from the conversation. Um, and also vanished is this idea that the United States is going to prevent the market uh, from the Chinese from using the market to meet their energy needs. You think 10 years ago, there was the Unical episode where basically the United States government and Congress prevented uh, China from buying an American oil and gas company because they thought it was a threat to national security. So you've had a movement away from that. You've had the reality that the world has found a way to commercially extract large, large quantities of unconventional oil and gas and that no longer are people, uh, companies being forced to go to very extreme high political risk locations to extract energy. In fact, there is a lot 
you know, potentially uh, almost endless source of energy in low political risk areas of the world. So I think there's some just objective realities, but in terms of what this we've kind of seen in terms of Chinese behavior, I'll just mention two things very quickly. One, I think it has affected how China, you, you can see it in the goals that China has put forward in its energy strategy, particularly on the side of natural gas. These very ambitious goals for introducing more and more natural gas into their economy in a very short time frame, just given mm. the scale. And I think that this is only achievable um, if there are multiple, multiple sources from which China can get this gas. And if you look at China's relationship with Russia, you look at China's preparations uh, to import LNG, their relationship with Australia, their interest in developing their own domestic resources, that basically they feel they have multiple resources from which they can satisfy their needs rather than feeling this imperative to, to develop something more singular. And then secondly and lastly, I would say, if you look at the nature of the investments that China is making overseas that are related to energy, there's a perceptible movement away from focusing on equity oil investments, actually owning oil yeah. in Africa and Latin mm -hmm. America, and more of a shift towards investing in places where China can learn about technology that it can take home and develop its own domestic unconventional resources. So you see more investments in Canada. Um, more interest in the United States. These are not the same investments that you make under a paradigm of scarcity. Mm. Kevin, the last word, and again, briefly. Yeah, a minute or two. Uh, three points. One is, I say this to an American audience, in Asia, it's important for our American friends to understand that the economic ground is changing profoundly under America's feet. One of the graphs contained in this report simply does a very simple bar graph which says any country in Asia, China is now a greater trading partner for any of those countries than the United States. <coughs> any of them. Secondly, go out by region. Uh, China is a more significant trading partner with Africa. China is now an equal trading partner with Europe uh, compared with the United States. Uh, and then Latin America is the only place where there is a gap, a, a significant gap, but it is narrowing. And where trade goes, investment follows, and the investment patterns will come. So I simply say to my American friends in Asia, understand that when we talk about the emergence of two Asias, an economic Asia and a security Asia, you feel it and sense it on the ground. And I would really say to my American friends, get out there more and sense it and understand it. Because unless we engage in some of the what I describe as malleabilities presented by this current period in time, I really worry about long-term bifurcation uh, because once you've got a bifurcated security and economic set of drivers, and frankly you do end up in a position which no regional country wants to be in in Asia, which is the ultimate grand strategic choice in terms of which way you go. Second concluding point is this, and it builds on that uh, last question about how do you construct a global order when there's no G1, question mark, is there a G2, uh, is there a G0, um, or, and what about the G20? I think we are looking at, going out to mid-century, a much more complex global, let's call it political economic reality, and, and economic security and strategic reality. But you need within that a range of powers who are committed to the singularity of an argument that we need a functioning order. There may be a secondary debate, uh, which is about the exact nature of the order in levels of detail, but frankly it's not that long ago in international history, we had a period where there was no order. And that actually prevailed for a long time prior to that and it was very ugly. So, within the international community today with the rise of China, the rise of India, and of course you've got the BRICS, uh, you also have in the G20 framework a bunch of middle powers including ourselves, the Canadians and others. Frankly, why I keep arguing, both a realist and a liberal internationalist view of this, is there has to be sufficient investment um, on the part of the existing great powers, the emerging powers and middle powers on the rolling construction reinvention of an order. Because the, gr the great global challenges against order, whether it's pandemics, whether it's climate, whether it's Al-Qaeda, whether it's ISIL, whether it's ISIS, those who seek to bring the order down, are going to actually multiply rather than reduce. And therefore, that great global public good is not just going to be constructed by accident, it is constructed by public policy design. And what I argue for here is a fundamental change in Suwe, 
way of thinking and the way in which our Chinese friends and our American friends and others approach this, that this requires action. And my very concluding sentence is, yes, Megan is right. You can actually chart where you could construct sufficient political capital between the US and China out of area, that is beyond Asia, to build sufficient strategic trust to begin to do this. But frankly, unless you are doing it simultaneously with cooperative security policy engagement in Asia, through what I describe in the report as the evolution of an Asia-Pacific community, you won't get sufficient political and diplomatic ballast to do it. And that's why I argue for a synthesized approach embracing both. Oh, very well said. So for, for actually giving us such a positive impulse in trying to challenge us to think about building uh, cooperatively between China and the US, a, a, in a constructive fashion, uh, elements of an order, and ultimately, a, a new a new order, I would say, what an exciting challenge. And I don't think an American or a Chinese might have imagined it as vividly as uh, Kevin, as an Australian, able to look with a little bit more independence at both of the parties, and an individual who's not only a part of the scholarly community, but been in the political arena. So for the report, I would say, Good reading, and for our panelists, thank you very much. Good. <laughs> comparable, Peter, uh, comparable individuals of comparable standing in the Standing Committee of the Politburo with him. <clears throat> so he is more powerful, just as China is more powerful. And there is something about the man's vision in terms of the extension of uh, <coughs> China's um, success story at home and its influence abroad, which represents significant lines of departure from the past. It is certainly more confident, others would describe it as more assertive, and it is certainly not a continuation of the ancient maxim of Deng Xiaoping, which is hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead. Uh, that uh, Chinese expression governed China's external engagement with the world for some decades. It has disappeared from the public language of Xi Jinping and the Chinese government in the last couple of years. Third question I ask is, under Xi Jinping, uh, what are China's underlying strategic perceptions of future US political, economic and military power, including Beijing's conclusions about Washington's grand strategy towards China? I've sought to reflect on this based on not just what's in the public literature and the public declaratory statements of uh, US policy, but having, uh, with the support of the Belfast Centre, been in and out of China at least a dozen times last year, speaking to think tanks, academics, policy advisors, policy makers, Chinese leaders of one description or another, uh, whose, an whose anonymity is buried throughout this report. <laughs> um, but I've so sought to do that in order to add um, flesh and blood <coughs> to the otherwise somewhat impenetrable statements of Chinese declaratory policy. So what's the bottom line on this observation? The baseline Chinese view, when you strip it all away in terms of what they perceive to be uh, China's uh, grand, uh, uh, the Americans' grand strategy towards China, is that they have concluded by and large that the United States, uh, whatever the United States may say or do, ultimately uh, will never readily yield its position as either number one in the region or number one in the world. And this core strategic judgment on the part of our Chinese friends shapes so much of their added concerning China's uh, capacity and constraints for the decade ahead under Xi Jinping's leadership. For those of you who haven't seen the report, as it's just coming out online now, it asks these six or seven questions. Number one, given that economic strength is the foundation of national power, is China's economic rise sustainable over the decade ahead, or is it likely to falter? My conclusion in the midst of some controversy on these questions recently is that on balance it will continue to grow, albeit at a lesser rate. Any assumption of collapsism concerning uh, China's future I think uh, is unsophisticated in its analysis and the part of some it is a triumph of hope over fact. <coughs> I'd simply leave that for the discussion. The second point and question that I raise is as follows. If this is sustainable, that is, uh, the continued expansion of Chinese power and influence, uh, 
Uh, will China deploy its newfound influence under the leadership of Xi Jinping in a different way to which it was done in the past under previous Chinese leaders? My answer to that question is, yes, it will. It will be different and significantly so. And that's anchored in two key variables. One is China now has more regional and global power than his predecessors did, uh, either three years ago or 13 years ago or certainly 23 years ago. Uh, but beyond that, there is something quite diff different in the character and the personality of this Chinese leader. He is, as I've said, uh, around this university for much of last year, certainly uh, the most powerful Chinese leader since Deng Xiaoping, and arguably, and I know Rod McFarquhar has this view, uh, the most powerful Chinese leader since Mao. The difference is a key analytical one. When Deng was leader, there were many other revolutionary leaders from the period of China's revolutionary formation in 49 <coughs> and the decades preceding, who basically were co-equals uh, with Deng in the Communist Party hierarchy, Chen Yun and people like that. In the case of uh, Xi Jinping, we do not see um, that um, presence of China-American relationship. And then finally, our cleanup hitter is Professor Tony Sage. Tony is, I would say, Mr. China for Harvard. Tony has spent more time and sent more energy investing in building relations and training programs between the U.S. and China than anyone, and has a spectacular set of programs. All three of us are part of a, a China working group in which these issues have been discussed and debated, but you'll get a chance to hear from the perspective of somebody who's a great China scholar, as well as somebody who's thinking about the energy pieces, uh, about whether the initial effort to give more content, more positive content to a new form of great power relations is uh, good enough. So, Kevin, thank you very much for coming home. Thank you very much, Graham, and thank you, uh, colleagues, one and all, for being here, and students of the Harvard Kennedy School and from the broad, broader Harvard community. Uh, firstly, to uh, thank uh, the Belfast Centre and Graham for the opportunity to be among you last year uh, and to engage in a rehabilitation program post her career in Australian political life. So thank you for that. I remain in continuing exile here in the United States. The question that I've tried to wrestle with in this report is when you look at the continued rise of China and the continued power of the United States in the world of the 21st century, not just how is this going to turn out, because we can simply assume that this is all, all written in the stars, uh, but what can we do about it? And what can we do about it in terms of shaping a future based on sufficient commonality of values, sufficient commonality of interest to craft a peaceful and prosperous future between these two giant gorillas in the living room of the international relations environment of the 21st century. That's China and the United States. I've tried to do that uh, by dividing my report into a couple of parts. The first part seeks to be analytical, and that is to look to the extent that I can at some very basic questions uh, History is against us when it comes to the US and China forging a common future together. This guy up here, he's not Chinese and he's not American, he's Greek, his name's Thucydides. He wrote the history of the Peloponnesian Wars. And he made this extraordinary observation about Athens and Sparta. It was the rise of Athens and the fear that this inspired in Sparta that made war inevitable. And hence, a whole literature about something called the Thucydides Trap. This guy here, he's not American and he's not Greek, he's Chinese. His name is Sun Tzu. He wrote The Art of War. And if you see his statement underneath, it's along these lines, attack him where he's unprepared, appear where you are not expected. Not looking good so far for China and the United States. This guy is an American. His name's Graham Allison. In fact, he's a teacher at the Kennedy School over there in Boston. He's working on a single project at the moment, which is does the Thucydides trap about the inevitability of war between rising powers and established great powers apply to the future of China-US relations? It's a core question. 
And what Graham has done is explore 15 cases in history since uh, the 1500s to establish what the precedents are. And 11 out of 15 of them, let's, let me tell you, they've ended in catastrophic war. to the forum tonight. I'm Graham Allison, the director of the Belfer Center, and I'm not uh, Greek and I'm not Chinese. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, basically a redneck American from North Carolina, but very pleased to be here. Uh, we have a spectacular evening for you where we're celebrating the uh, production of Kevin Rudd's report, U.S.-China 21, The Future of U.S.-China Relations under Xi Jinping where Kevin, as the subtitle says, tries to build a framework for con of constructive realism for a common purpose. In a word, uh, the purpose of this project, which Kevin pursued last year uh, as a fellow at the Belfer Center, uh, is to give content to the phrase that Xi Jinping uh, first articulated and that Xi Jinping and President Obama embraced at Sunnydale uh, called a, quote, new form of great power relations. So essentially the question is, what means new form of great power relations? And obviously it means not repeating the same mistakes that have been repeated so often that in previous forms of rise versus rule, ended up in conflict, as Kevin suggested, or so-called Thucydides trap. But the notion that a former prime minister who was in his first incarnation a foreign service officer in Australia uh, and a Mandarin speaker from high school uh, and who's had a deep scholarly interest would, after a great political career, spend a year here with us at Harvard at the Kennedy School at the Belfer Center was a fantastic opportunity for, for all of us. So we were thrilled to have the former prime minister here last year. He's now moved to New York, but remains a senior fellow non-resident, and so he comes back here regularly. And uh, this report is the first stage. This is the sort of executive summary of the report, which will be a longer report, but the content of it is what we're discussing tonight. Kevin's going to take about five or six minutes just to give us some highlights from the report. And then we have two excellent panelists who are going to comment on this from their own perspectives. Megan O'Sullivan uh, is a professor of practice here who leads the Geopolitics of Energy uh, initiative. And Megan has been, therefore, very interested in how changes in supply and demand of energy are impacting globally, but including China and the 